Voice of San Diego podcasts are made possible in part by Border Angels. Border Angels is out with a new podcast called Bad Hombre. Every Monday at noon, listen to a new episode with Border Angels founder Enrique Morones and guests. They'll be discussing border issues, immigration policy, hope for change, and more. Look for the Bad Hombre Border Angels podcast on Apple Podcasts or online at www.borderangels.org. And I'm telling you to this very day, a time when we were uh, not very long ago, just $200,000 in debt going, how are we going to get out of this mess? We're, we're in, uh, in trouble here. A lady at the end of the year came along and, and said, what do you guys need? And we said, we need help financially to get over this bump. And she goes and she wrote out a check for two hundred thousand dollars. I don't know if you call that a miracle. I sure do. Um. (laughs) Welcome to I Made It in San Diego, voice of San Diego's podcast about the stories behind the region's businesses, the big and the small and the people who made them what they are. I'm Dallas McLaughlin. And in this week's show, a story about how one man built a business by giving kids a place to learn about the arts and perform on stage. Back in the late 1970s, musical theater was growing from coast to coast. Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? Wouldn't you think my collection's complete? Wouldn't you think I'm the girl, the girl who has everything? Semi-professionals looking for a chance to shine had different options when it came to performing. However, kids didn't have that luxury. Outside of a school play or maybe a church choir presentation, kids didn't have a lot of places to act or sing or dance. Paul Russell was one of those semi-professional actors working side jobs while he tried to make it. He just never realized that one of those side jobs would turn into Christian Youth Theater, an after-school arts program for kids ages 8 to 18, and that it would eventually turn into the largest youth theater program in the world. And this all started in El Cajon? El Cajon. In El Cajon. Good things do come from El Cajon. (laughs) (laughs) The box. Yeah, the box. In high school, were you doing theater? And at San Diego State, were you doing theater? Was that your passion? Yeah, I got into doing theater in high school a little bit. And then when I got to San Diego State, I did quite a bit of theater. And then after um, college, Continued to do theater around San Diego and did quite a bit of Starlight. I was kind of the comedic role because I don't have a great voice. Mm -hmm. So I could do character roles and have a lot of fun doing that. And were it was it, you know, were you like, hey, I'm gonna make it as an actor, or was that always just kind of an afterthought? Something you did for fun? Well, I think everybody starts to go into it going, I'm gonna make it big. Uh But I realized I also had a wife. I had a couple kids and then two more kids. So I had four kids and a wife and um, I got a degree from San Diego State and I needed to pay all these bills. So I became a teacher to make a living while I also did performing, had an agent. Uh, For those of you that have been around San Diego a long time, I'll remember Mary Crosby, bless her heart. She was most of our agent. And uh, she would send us out on jobs when films were being done here in San Diego or commercials being cut or. Mm -hmm. um, Right. So I I did it on the side. Paul got his master's degree in 1976 due to a teacher shortage in the city at the time. He didn't wait long to land a job teaching drama at Christian High School in East County. What was just a fun way to pay bills and work in theater would end up changing the rest of Paul's life. To. Our surprise, it caught on really quick. I mean, um, lots of kids got involved. The whole school got involved. We did um, shows and got a lot of attention from the community, and they were really successful. So that's when my uh, vice principal came to me and said, hey, what are you doing over the summer? Um, Wouldn't you like to put on a show? I'll do all the administration. You do everything that happens on stage Mm -hmm. and um, we'll put on a show together. You know, the Mickey Rooney thing. Let's put on a show. (laughs) (laughs) At the urging of Christian High's vice principal, Paul decided to put on a show during the summer. There were only three problems. 
They didn't have any money, they didn't have a cast, and they didn't have a place to perform. However, Paul had a plan and a name that would bring it all together, Christian Community Theater. So I went to my dad and I said, hey, dad, would you help give us some seed money to get the royalties to start rehearsing the show that we want to do? And we think we can market it really well because there are at that time about 300 churches in San Diego, 1980. Mm Mm-hmm. We will advertise to all those churches, all the musical directors in all those churches. We will call or write a letter and um, tell them what we're doing. Let's bring all the churches together, which was the name of our company, Christian Community Theater, Mm -hmm. bringing all the best talent that was in San Diego from all those different churches. And that very first show, we had over 47 different churches represented in the cast, the orchestra, and the crew. The first production was The Sound of Music. Okay. And a perfect show to combine all the churches in, right? Mm-hmm. And um, we had like 60 different nuns from <laughs> every denomination in the <laughs> in the city. Pentecostals and That's Baptists. Right. <laughs> and um, we, we, I needed $2,000 for just to get permission to do the show. Okay. And then we needed to find a venue, and there was no venue that would let us do it for free. Surprise, surprise, right? Yeah. The only place we could find was uh, the Mount Helix Amphitheater, which at that time was a county park. And they, in the deed, when the park was given to the county, it said that it had to be free to the public. So we jumped on that statement, <laughs> yeah. and the park said, great, yeah, you can use it for free. And we signed the agreement with the park before we realized there was no electricity up there. (laughs) There was no water. There was no plumbing. And so that first show, we had to um, get SDG&E to come up and put in electricity. We had to bring up lots of porta potties and um, we borrowed water from the neighbor that was just down the hill a little bit. With Paul taking care of the creative side, the vice principal, Dave Elliott, took care of the business side. Using their combined connections at the city's churches, they started putting together mailing lists, and they found a rehearsal space at the old Scott Memorial Church in North Park. Everything was coming together. And they let us use the facility for free. We would rehearse every night. We put in over uh, 70 hours of rehearsal and um, wow. to put the show together. That's and I think we did it out of... Um, the love of doing theater, but also a little bit of stupidity in that we didn't realize how much work it was going to take and how much money it was going to take. We didn't realize that people were not going to want to walk up to Mount Helix, but that's the only way to get to Mount Helix. Um, Yeah, because there's no parking up top. Yeah, there's no parking. Yeah. So back then people were allowed to park along the side of the hill. Um, Back then, uh, There was no um, electricity, Mm -hmm. so we had to bring in electricity just to have lighting because all the activities that were ever up there were during the daytime. So what we did, and it was so primitive, so tacky, um, (laughs) there were sawhorses across the front of the stage, and we did those lights that clamped in your garage. You know, you'd squeeze them and clamp on. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Work work lights. Exactly, work lights. It looked like a horror movie, right? Because all you saw was nostrils and the tops of people's eyes yeah. as as uh, Maria Von Trapp saying the hills are alive. She looked like a horror flick. <laughs> but, but And we didn't have money for sets. So I would go every day after um, work to Montgomery Wards, which is like Sears and Roebuck, right? Mm-hmm. And get their refrigerator boxes, put them on my father-in-law's truck, haul them over to my driveway, cut them apart, and build uh, theater scenery with them. My goodness. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, very sturdy scenery too. (laughs) Well, and that first night in the show, the wind came up and knocked them all over. (laughs) Because so it was like really, this yeah. is this is crazy. Yeah, you're on top of a mountain. That was your fault for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so how many uh, how many people did uh, Mount Helix hold at the time? I mean, and were you was that first show selling well? Yes, to our unbelievable surprise, over five thousand people came to that very first show. Wow! And again, 
it was not a quality show. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it was that sense of community and sense of going to one of the most beautiful spots in San Diego Mm -hmm. and the fun of people from 40 different churches telling their friends, hey, we're doing this crazy thing up at Mount Helix. Come on up and celebrate with us and have some fun. The show was a success, and in Paul's mind, that was it. He was heading back to Christian High to teach. But the parents of the kids from all these churches were asking, well, what are you going to do for our kids? And we said, nothing. We got jobs. (laughs) We were going back to work. And they said, no, this has changed our kids, and it's become their friends, and they want to do more theater. Hmm. And I said, well, we could do something after school, uh, but I've got a real job. I've got to work. Yeah. And so... um, about six months later, we started CYT. I was also Which is to, Christian Youth Theater. Christian Youth Theater, yeah. right? And I was um, at that time also employed by San Diego Junior Theater. Don Ward, uh, a name that old time San Diego people know, was part of. And you just said uh, just passed away recently. Yes. So rest in peace, Don yes. Ward. Oh, I, bless I his knew heart. Don for years. Yes, he literally raised a few generations to love theater, love the arts, love dance, and um, he was truly my mentor. And I worked for him at San Diego Junior Theater, and I went to him and I said, hey, we're thinking of doing this kids program out in El Cajon. What do you think? And he said, there is never enough theater in San Diego. Mm. Yes, start it, do it, you need to do this thing. And so that's what we did. We started it with 24 kids Mm -hmm. and uh, four teachers. And we did You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. And then we'd also hold classes and those kids would take classes in voice, dance or drama. And again, the show wasn't very good. It was in a little tiny chapel with 200 seats, but to this day, some of those kids are still, and, and now they're in their 40s, you mm-hmm. know, but some of those kids are still doing uh, theater, professional theater. They're in the arts, making a difference, and uh, it, it changes your life. It was 1981, and Christian Youth Theater had officially launched. In the second year, CYT went from 24 kids to 47 kids. Mothers would invite Girl Scout troops to earn their arts badges. They invited elementary schools to come see shows, sparking the first ever school day shows, and the idea kept catching on. The idea itself, theater for kids by kids, was simple, but the execution was not easy. It was so much hard work. Uh huh. But when you're in your uh, middle to late 20s, you have lots of energy. Mm -hmm. And if you have a supportive wife and she's like, well, yeah, let's do this. We, for the first six years, did not ever take any money out of it. It was just kind of an extra curricular activity. Were you still working as a teacher still at the time? Still working full okay. time. I was still working for the um, city schools as um, in the gifted program as a consultant. And I would do programs with the uh, gifted programs in San Diego with theater. Mm-hmm. And I was still had an agent. So I was trying just to make enough money to support a family. And then I would do CYT on the side more as the administrator to hire the teachers and to oversee the show to make sure the show got up and, and, and went well. With a growing company, not only came operational bills, but taxes as well. After that first show, mm-hmm. we get this stuff from the government saying, okay, you either owe taxes on this or, and we go, or what? Or you need to be a nonprofit so that you're not paying taxes on it. We had no idea what they were talking about. So we went to an attorney who just happened to see the show at Mount Helix and he said, I love what you guys are doing. I'll do your nonprofit status for free. Wow. And back then it was a couple thousand dollars to have that process done. And we're going, that's so cool. What a cool miracle that he just happened to be there and is willing to do this. And those kind of things happened over and over and over again. CYT became a nonprofit created a board of directors, and continued to grow. They moved out of the church and began renting a bigger church to hold classes. Then they would rent public school auditoriums as a space to perform. It wasn't cheap, and it wasn't making much money either. So in this early days, it's basically paying for itself is what's happening. Uh, Not even. Nope? Okay. No, like at the end of every semester, we'd end up either short or let's fundraise for the next one. And so we would say, parents... 
help us. And so mm-hmm. we would come up with fundraising ideas and do all the things that every school in the world does. Mm-hmm. You sell chocolate or you sell magazines or you do a big fundraising evening where you hopefully pray that people will be generous and, and underwrite the arts. Yeah. Were you, at what point were you like, okay, this is, this is my job now. This is what I'm going to do. Yeah. So it was six years into it. So 1987? Uh, 1987. Mm-hmm. And the board said, you know what? We've got enough money in reserve to, to hire you for the next couple of months. What do you think? <laughs> for the next couple of months. <laughs> yeah, for the next couple of months. And if we have a good next couple of months, um, we could continue to pay you a small stipend or a small salary. Do you think you'd like to come on full time? By that time, I had left Christian High School and was the artistic director for San Diego Junior Theater. Oh. I actually took uh, Don Ward's job, and um, and I said, yeah, let's give it a go. Let's sure. give it a try. And San Diego Junior Theater was going through some difficult times at that time, and so they it was a great time for them to get new leadership and a great time for me to make a break and not make that drive down to San Diego all the time. So now you're you're in it. You're in it for three months. You yeah. got this three month contract with your own company yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be employed. Um, how did it go? Well, it's crazy when a person can give uh, their full time to something. It's amazing the synergy and the energy and the excitement that it it can take on a life of its own. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to go into um, this little tiny office that was donated to us every single day, start contacting different schools, start marketing the program better, um, start reaching out, getting better teachers and quality um a quality program catches on a lot quicker. And so we actually saw a huge uh, bump in enrollment, a huge bump in attendance to shows to where there was more than just a little bit left over at the end of, um, at the end of a session. And so they were able to keep you on. Keep me on. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. 37 years later now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's always month to month. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You're still a young guy. You're married now. You have all four of your kids by 1987. And this is not the best paying job. Was there a time when you thought, I just can't do this? Yeah, so many <laughs> times, right? And I think those words came from my wife more than me. But um, <laughs> she's like, because she was running the box office out of our garage. So she'd have big wheels going up and down the driveway Mm -hmm. and she was, she'd turn around and put another load of laundry into the um, washing machine. And then she'd go wake up the babe, uh, you know, get the baby up to change it. And so to her, she is really the saint because I would go off to the schools, to a rehearsal, to start um, getting sets, having meetings and, she was the one that had to do all the business end of it. She was the bookkeeper. She was the business manager. She ran the box office all by herself. And she really was the thing that held it together. But there was many times we we're going, why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. And then these kids would come back and say, hey, I just got into a graduate program or I just got into college on a theater scholarship or um, I just got a part in this film or I, I got a part in the show that I'm doing that's going on national tour. And thank you for making a difference in our lives. And we're going, maybe there is something to this. And maybe the arts gives you something more than just a living. Mm-hmm. It fills your tank emotionally. It, it gives you something that you're going, there's something to this. There's something deeper and richer than just a paycheck. So was it just a kind of a constant, um, I mean, 24 seven kind of deal for, yeah. for probably ever, right? <laughs> yeah, it really is. It's very, it's very consuming, but when your mind loves it, mm-hmm. it never seems like work. It just seems like, ah, oh, this is so much fun and this is exciting and getting to meet wonderful, wonderful people and people that love life and love the arts and, um, love the passion of storytelling. Ah, it's, yeah. a, it's a great world. 
When we come back, CYT and Paul Russell experience the growing pains that come with going from one location to 10 and the financial hardships that that kind of quick expansion can cause. I'm Janice Shatman. I'm a fairly recent, uh, I'm a newcomer to San Diego County. I retired here. I'm a member of the Voice of San Diego because when I came here, I knew nothing. An extended family member appointed out Voice of San Diego, and I've been an avid listener ever since. Everything that I knew that allowed me to vote intelligently on local issues came from the Voice of San Diego. And if you don't support investigative journalism like that, it won't be there for you. I'm Ben Haddad. I'm a Voice of San Diego member. I support Voice of San Diego because it is a a vital resource uh, to our community. It's just important that we stay on top of what's going on and you guys are very much in the forefront of reporting. You have to be able to shine the light on things uh, to get to the bottom of stuff. It'd be nice if folks were more honest, just in general, all over the world, everywhere, but that's just not the way it is. People want to hide things and the press is so instrumental in rooting a lot of that out. As an independent nonprofit news organization, Voice of San Diego is guided by its mission. Every day we publish stories that define the conversation in San Diego, stories that inspire a community of critical thinkers and shape our shared reality. But in return, we depend on this community, on you, to support our critical work. Your contribution today enables Voice of San Diego to cover San Diego and its complex conversations around accountability, good government, and pressing local issues. Quality journalism makes a difference, and your support makes what we do each day at Voice of San Diego possible. Without you, stories wouldn't just go unread, they would go untold. Donate today at voiceofsandiego.org and invest in our journalists' work. Informative, engaging stories that we are all better for having read. Welcome back to I Made It in San Diego. I'm Dallas McLaughlin. Christian Youth Theater was started in a garage in El Cajon by Paul and Cheryl Russell in 1981. Ten years later, the group started to expand from one location to several, causing a lot of constant financial stress, but financial help also comes with a little bit of faith. Here's Paul Russell. There were were times where our board would say, you know what, we're we're probably going to have to close the doors because... We can't financially make this work. Mm -hmm. And I know this sounds so corny, but being Christian community theater, being Mm -hmm. Christian youth theater, the element of faith would always come in and saying, God, if you helped us start this crazy thing, and we really believe this is not of us, it's really part of your maybe master plan, please help us out here. We need help. And I'm telling you to this very day, a time when we were uh, not very long ago, just two hundred thousand dollars in debt. Going, how are we going to get out of this mess? We're we're in uh, in trouble here. A lady at the end of the year came along and and said, "What do you guys need?" And we said, "We need help financially to get over this bump." And she goes and she wrote out a check for two hundred thousand dollars. I don't know if you call that a miracle. I sure do um, <laughs> in, in my book and it got us over another hump. But it was those kind of things that would happen over and over and over again when we got to a point where we said, we can't keep doing this mm-hmm. or who's going to come along or is this event going to be successful enough? And I have to say every time uh, God's been faithful. And, what and I'm, I, I hope that doesn't sound too, you know, churchy or anything, but it really was a faith. Thing. Well, it's interesting. What is the, what was the emphasis for you making it Christian community theater, Christian youth theater? I mean, obviously, that's a big part of it for you. It's yeah. in the name. So, what was the importance for you to make it part of the of the group? Well, um, gosh, interesting. You say that. The initial one was we truly were. Christian community theater. It was the community of churches in San Diego that got mm-hmm. us started. So that's where that name come from. Um, and because I taught at a Christian school, um, the emphasis of 
of infusing our faith into everything that we do, to me, plays a big part. It's not, you know, many times uh, people of faith separate their faith from their work or, you know, people say, well, business is business. But when you bring along a faith to it, um, it changes sometimes the way you do work. It changes sometimes the way you practice business. And um, to me, I wanted kids to love the arts with all their heart. And I wanted them to use their gifts and abilities and talents, but also not to have to reject their faith and say, well, when I'm on stage, I'm a different uh, person. And I don't mean that as an actor. Of course, you're a different person. But I still can be a person of faith, still hold true to my values and my core principles, mm -hmm. and still be in a really good performer, really good actor, really good comedian, really good um, uh, person of talent. Parents were tired of driving from all over the county for CYT and El Cajon, and they wanted Paul to move to a location closer to their towns. He liked the idea, but couldn't do it on his own. So Paul told the parents, if you want CYT in your area, you'll need to help set it up. And so they did. Moving from location to location, from school to school, CYT found a way. I think it was uh, 80, 86, and it was Escondido and Chula Vista were the two that said, we just can't drive into El Cajon anymore. And so I said, well, that's great, but I can't drive there. So you need to help me find people in your own towns in your own areas to help teach classes and help me find locations where we can do rehearsals and hold classes and put on shows. And the parents have been amazing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, what, what do they call them? Uh, helicopter parents that oh, yeah. <laughs> they want something for their kids. So they're willing to do almost anything. And so they would hit the pavement and find uh, a school that was willing uh, uh, to allow us to use rehearsal space or classroom space and then a place to do a show. And I think we've probably been in more theaters than any other theater company in San Diego. I think I know almost every single school that has a theater, <laughs> every uh, um, auditorium we've, we've probably used. CYT then expanded to the Claremont area, then North County coastal cities, Temecula, Ramona, Del Mar, even Irvine. The whole time Christian Youth Theater, or CYT, was growing and expanding, the adult version of CYT, Paul's original idea that started back in 1980 with The Sound of Music, Christian Community Theater, which featured kids and adults, was still running strong on top of Mount Helix. In fact, CCT did three shows a summer, drawing nearly 50,000 patrons a year. We also ran the East County Performing Arts Center, for uh, five years until um, the city d decided to go in a di different direction. And so we had a full season of adult shows and um, doing three shows at each location at these 10 different areas. So basically 40 different shows every single year. My goodness. It was nuts. It was nuts. And that's when we ran in, we grew too fast mm -hmm. and started running into debt. So besides having someone come along and write a check to save the company, was there a plan to get out of that debt? So again, I am not a great businessman, but I always surrounded myself with a board that were way smarter than me. <laughs> uh, um, um, I didn't want yes people. I wanted people to help solve my weaknesses, right? And so business people would come along and say, well, look at your profit centers, expand on those and cut those programs that aren't able to support themselves. And that's hard when you're dealing with people and little kids and parents, but you make those hard decisions to keep the overall program alive. Now, what year did you guys start doing the kind of, the, I mean, the actual franchise model of going outside of the state of California? Yeah, it was 15 years into it. So what is that? 19... 1995, <laughs> 1994, 95. It was a family that moved to Chicago and he called me one night and he said, my kids want to move back to San Diego. I can't, my job is here. But they said, the only reason they want to come back is for CYT. And what can I do to start CYT in Chicago? And I said, are you crazy? We can't, we can't do <laughs> CYT in Chicago. Yeah. He goes, Okay, fine. Um, 
how can I go around your back and get it done? <laughs> he wasn't giving up. And yeah. so he found one of our um, CYT directors that had just graduated from college and said, would you come back and start the program? Live at our house, have a part-time job somewhere else, but start CYT in Chicago. They did. He started it. And to this day, Chicago is our largest program with over 10 different CYT programs in the Chicagoland area. Wow. It's crazy. They have uh, over 3,000 kids every single uh, semester taking classes in the arts. So when that was a success, you started branching out to other states. Yeah, and the truth is, uh, it's kind of a weird model. We never went after locations. Mm -hmm. So families would move to Kansas City. Another family would move to Atlanta. And they would call us and say, hey, you started it in Chicago. Can we start it here? And we said, I don't think you get how much work it is. <laughs> and we would send them a startup packet. And in this startup packet, there were 12 different bullet points that they had to achieve before we would say, okay, you're ready to start. And some areas would come back in three weeks and have them all done. So what were some of those bullet points? Bullet points, raise $5,000. Uh, a bullet point would be find a church or a school that could host the classes. Mm -hmm. Find a theater that you could put on a show in. Um, and each one of those bullet points had sub points that said it needs to be a, a approximately this large so that you can sell enough tickets to make enough money to mm -hmm. keep this venture going. Uh, can you give us a list of teachers that could teach drama, voice, dance? And during all that time, we were writing curriculum. So right now we have over 60 different curriculum classes that have a curriculum for them for dance, for drama, for voice, for uh, acting. And um, now we can actually, they can log on to our website and actually get curriculum for their teachers to have a good um, jumping off spot. And at this point, I mean, this is your full-time job and I imagine your wife's as well. Yes. Uh, yeah. And your kids have been growing up in this. I mean, did they take part in, in working for the company? Was this a family business almost from the get-go? Yeah, they had no choice. Uh, <laughs> they, they, yeah. <laughs> they, bless their hearts, uh, were such great sports. But, I mean, they would come as a child, as a baby and have to sit through rehearsals, mm -hmm. right? And they were always singing and dancing in the background and uh, doing whatever they could. and. Some of them loved the performing arts. Some of them liked the back side of the performing arts. Mm -hmm. My daughter right now, uh, my youngest daughter, she liked backstage more. And so she became a hairstylist and then now is working in Hollywood as a hairstylist for TV shows. Mm -hmm. uh, she just finished um, Last Man Standing, that series. For six years, oh, she okay. was the hairstylist on that show. Wow. And, um Great living. She did really well, and she's uh, done well w with that. My One of my sons uh, became a filmmaker, mm -hmm. and um, he did uh, Invisible Children and did a, a very successful documentary on the war in Uganda and is still a filmmaker, and I'm very proud of him. My oldest son was more of the tech side, and he has now developed our website that is one of the very best in the in the country that does ticketing a program and database and a registration. And um, it, it, it's truly a remarkable website that services all of our uh, 28 programs around the country. The fourth child you didn't hear about? That's Paul's oldest daughter, Janie Russell Cox, who has now taken on a larger role in the company. So within this company, I mean, you know, now uh, 1981, it starts it's still going strong. I'm not sure. You know, you were in your early 20s then. So I would say what, late 60s? Uh, middle 60s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure, I'm, sure. I'm 64. 64? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's late. Uh, so you're, you're in your 60s now and you're still running strong with it. Um, but it seems that your, your, one of your other daughters has stepped in and started to kind of help yeah. push that into the next generation like you're speaking about a little bit is keeping it yes up for the next generation uh what is that like working very closely now with your family 
in a very um, management kind of situation. Yeah. You know what? It I love it in that um, I see in her such incredible leadership qualities and she does a much better job of it than I do. And she <laughs> does it with such passion, but she does it with such excellence and she does it with much more grace. Mm -hmm. And and so she took over the uh, artistic director of San Diego um, CYT and I couldn't be more pleased. Now, do I bite my tongue a lot? Yes. <laughs> and do I think, uh, that's not the decision I would make, but I've got to let her take control and she's done a marvelous job. We, uh, in the last few, de since I left a few years ago, she has done a way better job and the program has continued to increase and do better than when I was there. You've expanded, you've gone to this point where you're now across the country. Uh, have you reached a point where you're like, okay, we need to scale back. Have we, or is everything going, going roses? That's the wrong term. But is everything yeah, coming yeah, up roses? Yeah, you know there, I mean? there, there you there go. You there go. go. I, I found that's it. That's from a musical. I, that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because that's my language, right? Yeah. Um, we, we haven't had to scale back yet. And that's to me very exciting um, because it continues to grow. We've had uh, China contacted us five years ago and said, we love the model that CYT offers. What can you do for the schools in China? And so they've had us come out for five years in a row and work with their music programs and train teachers in China of how to teach kids to be creative, how to use music and drama in the curriculum to teach kids not just facts, but how to use those facts and how to be creative with what they've learned from a book. The documentation and research on it is unbelievable that, and I know, you know, people say that about whatever field they're in, but truly the arts is one of those that kids that are involved in the arts for at least two years do better in school, score higher on SAT, get better scores in math. They do better in um, social environments. They do better in gaining uh, better jobs and higher paying jobs. And the skills that you acquire from being an actor or being a performer is so widespread across the board. It makes you just a better person. And, um, and that's why I believe in it so much because I really do believe we're changing kids um, lives and developing character one stage at a time. And that's uh, kind of what I wanted to ask you as well. You pretty much answered it there is the role that you believe CYT, CCT plays in the community. I mean, not just the local community, but as you've grown globally, pretty much um, what you kind of see it, uh, how you see it impacting children and their families. I mean, you, you pretty much answered it. But um, is there maybe one or two stories you can think of that, that will stick with you as maybe something that you you know for a fact this is how we've impacted our yeah. community and this is something that I can always hold with me as a victory? Well, one of the fun success stories that I – and it's really nothing that we did, but um, uh, you, I think you know him too, uh, is Chris Rubio. Mm -hmm. He was a kid that definitely had ADD, couldn't concentrate for very long, was always moving around – couldn't keep his attention uh, during rehearsals when he was a kid. But that dynamism and that uh, constant movement made him a dynamic performer. And he auditioned for Stomp, the national tour, uh, not very long after he got out of high school, made the tour, became one of their lead directors, toured for five years around the country, then another couple years in Europe, came back to the U.S., and he saw a need in kids that had disabilities. And I, I can't uh, not talk about him without getting a lump in my throat mm -hmm. because he has committed his life to helping kids in the arts who have disabilities. And every year at uh, the Rubio Studios, he touches lives in a way that is so powerful because he's taking kids with um, autism to uh, um, downs to, to whatever the issue that these mm -hmm. kids are dealing with. And he makes them 
the stars of a show. And he puts in all the sets, all the costumes, all the light. I mean, he does a fantastic job to see the light that, that he is in the community is really powerful and really moving. And um, I'm excited to say that we're still friends and we, we love each other and just to see that kind of thing. And we've seen that over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Not, not only do I think our list of, of alumni is pretty exciting uh, to see what they're doing in life. We mm-hmm. have people that have served on city councils, people that have uh, become medical doctors. Some of them are some of the best in the field of research in cancer right now because they could present their stories and they could do it at conferences because they had gained skills to where they had confidence. Um, we have uh, quite a few kids that have gone on and been on Broadway, done film and uh, making a living at it, uh, shoot a, a third of the cast at SeaWorld. We're CYT kids <laughs> and, and there's a ton of them at Disneyland that, you know, are working in the technical areas and, and in the uh, performance areas that are having the time of their life. To me, that's exciting to mm-hmm. see that kind of fruit and uh, it, it, it fills your tank. The Children's Theater Company that started in a garage in El Cajon is now the largest youth theater program in the world. Found in over 28 cities across the nation, CYT averages 20,000 students every semester, producing 112 shows a year, 178 youth theater summer camps, and drawing nearly 200,000 patrons every year. And CYT isn't close to slowing down. With two new affiliates opening in 2018, CYT plans on continuing that trend for the next decade. Thanks for listening to I Made It in San Diego. I wrote the show, Kinsey Moreland produced it, and Adam Greenfield mastered and mixed it. Visit voiceofsandiego.org slash podcast to learn more about our weekly Voice of San Diego political affairs show, our Good Schools for All education podcast, the Kept Faith sports podcast, Beer Talk Radio, and all the shows in Voice of San Diego's podcast network. If you like the show, go to voiceofsandiego.org and click the donate button. Or if you'd like to sponsor it, contact Kinsey at K-I-N-S-E-E at B-O-S-D dot O-R-G.